I was, I was, I was much younger. So young people, you have an opportunity. Uh, if you are in whatever age, you have an opportunity to, to learn. So let's um, uh, begin by turning to the scriptures, which is 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. Now we'll just read that portion of scripture. I'll come and make some comments on it later. Um, it's a well-known scripture. And it reads, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. There is need for young people to develop doctrinally. Um, indeed, not just for young people, every Christian should grow in the understanding of doctrine. Many who are professing Christians today are weak in understanding the basic framework of biblical doctrine. What I mean is many are weak in understanding this body of truth. And... Uh, The conviction, once you come to the conviction that Christian doctrine matters for Christian living and uh, you actually begin to study doctrine in a prayerful way, you begin to grow significantly spiritually. Thomas Watson, a Puritan, says, if you don't get established in doctrine, you won't grow. I have come across some friends of mine who were converted at the same time, even if not earlier, 40 years ago. You meet them today, they are still babies in the Lord. Still babies in the Lord. You know? Why? Many of them neglected doctrine. If you don't study doctrine, you won't grow. And I won't pull back that punch. I'm not apologizing for that statement. So you see how important doctrine is. The history of the church shows that many who had influence on the church uh, when you read church history, you read about great women of God, great men of God, and you discover that many of them were students of Christian doctrine. Many of them. There may be exceptions. I've read a bit of church history Many of the people that I have read they were men with, uh, who, who had a deep conviction of what they believed. It's a tragedy today that many Christians think that we are wasting time when we study doctrine. We need something practical. The others who even say doctrine is dry.
way of introduction. There are a number of headings I want us to look at. The first one is the need to develop doctrinally. The need to develop doctrinally. Now, just bear with me. Sometimes I will be using theology and doctrine interchangeably. I know that theology is quite broad, but we can use it in a narrower sense. Uh, when we say someone studied theology, they studied doctrine, but there are other things uh, that are included. But I'll be using theology in the sense of doctrine, so don't get mixed up. There is need to develop doctrinally or theologically. And I'll give a number of reasons why a person, a Christian, should develop doctrinally. What are the reasons? Number one, practical Christian living is based on understanding. Practical Christian living is based on understanding. There's a wonderful verse in Proverbs as a man thinks in his heart, so, who can finish that one? So he is. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. There is a close relationship, my friends, between what a person believes and how a person lives. There is a very close relationship. And we are saying uh, doctrine is the basis of living the Christian life. How we live the Christian life will be determined by our understanding of doctrine. What you believe determines how you live. Christian doctrine, when properly understood, builds our character and it is life-changing. It shapes the way we live, the way we think. To put it simply, Doctrine has a sanctifying effect upon a Christian. What do I mean, sanctifying effect? When you study doctrine prayerfully, carefully, the effect will be that you will be more and more be sanctified. You get to a point where your prayer will be every day if not all the time. Lord, make me like the Lord Jesus. Lord, I want to be holy. You are just obsessed with holiness. Why is it today that uh, there is a lot of worldliness among believers? Why is it that uh, today professing Christians are not as godly as we would want to see one reason could be just this neglect of doctrine. So the study of doctrine will shape the way we live. Our Lord Jesus Christ prayed eh, in John chapter 17, Sanctify them through thy, who can finish that one? Thy truth. We are talking about truth here. Doctrine, we are talking about truth here. We are talking about healthy teaching. Sanctify them by thy truth. And then, thy word is, is truth. Now, that clearly just shows you that we need truth in order to be 
sanctified. So that's the first reason. Uh, number two, doctrine influences our response to all kinds of situations. We live in a world of changing circumstances. Today you are married, next day you are a widower or a widow. Today you are healthy, next day your health breaks down. That's the kind of world we live in. There will be changes in this life. Now, we will respond either biblically to the changes that occur in our lives, or we will respond and biblically, if I can put it that way. But once we have understood doctrine, not just in, a, in an academic way, when we have assimilated doctrine in a prayerful manner, when these changes take place around us, we will respond biblically. Let me give you some example to illustrate that point. A few years ago, I lost my mother. She came to stay with us and uh, she was quite sick. It was a trying period for me. Every morning you wake up, mom is sick. Every morning she couldn't wake up. And I remember telling the Lord, but Lord, why don't you just take her? This is a bit too much. I can't bear this. But I think upon second thoughts again, <laughs> if I was a Pentecostal, I would have said, the Lord told me. <laughs> uh, um, it's like I, I began to think of the, the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, that whatever happens in our lives, the Lord permits it for a purpose, and that the Lord would grant us grace, even in situations like that. And I just prayed for grace. And, uh, and I realized it was not for me to dictate to the Lord when he should take mom. It was the Lord. He knew what he was doing. He knew the best time. And I just had to bow to the sovereignty of God. And the Lord gave me wisdom. And uh, uh, I think I stopped murmuring and, and complaining. I, I can't say I stopped sinning. <laughs> um, that's what I'm talking about. When you know doctrine, you respond uh, biblically to changing circumstances around you. Quite often when, it's, for instance, we experience bad things in our lives, we murmur, isn't it? We complain. And so I'm, I'm just showing you the, the importance of doctrine. And sometimes this thing will work in such a way that, ah, lack of a better thing, it would be so natural for you to just want to respond in this manner. Number three, doctrine shows us the God we worship. It's a pity we are living at times when the concept of God for many is far below what the Bible says God is. And uh, when you study doctrine, your eyes are opened to see just how great this God is. You begin to marvel at the greatness of God and all his other attributes. Especially when you focus on um, the doctrine of God itself, you study the attributes of God, uh, you see the greatness of God. And it changes your life. You don't take worship lightly. Dear friends, 
we begin our church service at 10 o'clock and whenever i start a church service at 10:01, i feel so uncomfortable i have to apologize to the church um why god is great when we have an appointment with a, a human being a president to make sure we are there before time many of us will go to church at whatever time and we are never bothered you see the problem the problem is that you have no right understanding of who god is you haven't yet come to the depth of who god is i'm just giving you uh, uh, some of these some of these things you, you, doctrine will show us the god we worship we get to know him better we begin to appreciate him more and more his love when we study the doctrines of grace we appreciate more and more of his grace Many professing Christians have a low understanding of the grace of God. And that's why this lead to gratitude. Lead to gratitude. In our Baptist circles, we normally begin our worship service with a hymn of praise or thanksgiving. And we will sing with vigor, with all our hearts, once we have studied doctrine and uh, uh, we 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 appreciate his grace more and more it illuminates the son's love the savior's love and the spirit's work in our lives we don't stop wondering you know when you stop wondering at the grace of god you have stopped growing something is wrong the moment you stop wondering that god loves you god chose you you are a christian something is drastically wrong in your life you don't take grace for granted as a result of understanding doctrine number four doctrine doctrinal beliefs are essential to our relationship with god the bible in hebrews says he who comes to god must believe that he exists you must believe in other words um you cannot even come near to god unless you have this belief you are convinced that god is that god is the creator so it's basic to our relationship with god number five doctrine and experience are related doctrine and experience are related a christian will go through uh spiritual experiences Exper a christian will experience joy now, what i'm saying here is the joy of salvation will be deepened in relation to our understanding of the doctrine of grace, of salvation. The more we understand what God has done in Christ Jesus, the more our comforts abound, the more we rejoice in God with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Without understanding, why are they one reason why? One reason why many who profess to be Christians, why their joy is shallow, it's just this lack of understanding doctrine, doctrine and experience are related. Let me give another example. The more you study sin, the more you study the work of Christ, the atoning work of Christ. Um, Bible talks about the doctrine of sin. 
what Jesus had to go through in order to redeem you, you study, you meditate. You know, you want to have nothing to do with sin. That's what we mean. Doctrine and experience are related. Your constant prayer will be, Lord, save me, deliver me from sin. So those are some of the reasons why we need doctrine. Maybe summarizing what I have said. There could be more things we can say on this, the necessity of doctrine. But by way of summarizing this first point, doctrine forms the very foundation of the Christian life. The very foundation of the Christian life. I get grieved sometimes when I see what is going on uh, in certain religious circles, especially in the charismatic circles. A friend of mine from Kenya yesterday, uh, we have a, a Zoom meeting every Tuesday and he was sharing. And he was sharing from the book of Hebrews and uh, how the Lord has delivered us from the fear of death, from death itself. And he was saying, many of those who profess to be Christians in the charismatic circles are in deliverance classes. You know, I have heard about deliverance classes, where they are put in these classes, they are taught um, that they need to be delivered. What am I talking about? Beware of the charism of charismatism. You will be messed up without doctrine. You will be messed up. Doctrine is solid food. That's what we need. Number two. We've looked at um, the need for doctrine. Number two, it is the duty of every Christian to study and grow in understanding doctrine. It's our duty. It's not something which is optional. It's not something we can choose to do or not do. We must study doctrine. It is a basic necessity. Many of us think, or some of us think, doctrine is just for leaders, elders, and pastors. It is the duty of every believer. It's a duty. Meaning, if you are not studying doctrine, you are sinning against God. You are sinning against the Lord. If you are not developing doctrinally, you are sinning. In the scriptures, we are commanded to love the Lord with all our hearts, but also with all our soul, with all our mind. One way of loving the Lord with all our mind is by devoting ourselves to study his truth. It shows that his truth matters. We love him. It's a duty of every Christian. And indeed, when we get born again, when we are converted, my friend, there is an innate desire. There is an inward desire to love the truth. We have a hunger for the word of God. <laughs> remember when I got converted, I remember reading through the book of Ezekiel. In one sitting, I started chapter one and I never stopped until I read it to the very end. We have a deep desire. And if you have no desire for truth, 
uh, it could be that you may not be a converted person. The Lord gives in us. It's like a baby. When a baby is born, it just wants to suck instinctively, isn't it? Yeah. It's when God converts us, he gives us the love of the truth. But we have to nurture that love of the truth in our lives. It is our duty. And, and so we won't find this duty burdensome. We will delight in studying God's truth. Indeed, when we are not studying doctrine, we grieve the Lord. My friend, there are great matters in this book. Sometimes I tell, sometimes I say, I hope I will be reading my Bible in heaven. I love my Bible. I hope if I was to live another 1,000 years, I would read God's word every day. We insult God when we are not. What we are saying is what he has done is not worth studying. It's not worth exploring. That's the message we are sending when we are not studying doctrine. So it's our duty to study doctrine. That's our number two point. Number three, the need for discipline. Studying will require discipline, isn't it? Indeed, discipline now here it applies to many other areas. This is what um, uh, William Buckley, it's a British uh, theologian, once wrote that nothing can be achieved without discipline. Sometimes we see people who are learned and we admire their learning. We admire uh, their performance. But little do we think that it took discipline. We see these men of God preaching wonderful sermons, sermons that build us. It takes discipline. As long as our goal is to know the truth and become godly, that must be the goal of discipline. So if you want to grow in understanding doctrine we have to develop discipline we have to be disciplined and uh, uh there are three things i'll say concerning discipline it requires daily effort discipline requires daily effort isn't it yes just as the youth in the gymnasium exerts himself to the uttermost on a daily basis a young person or a believer must spare no effort to understand doctrine. Daily effort. When Pastor Kalifungwa called me, if I could take up this seminar, I was rebuked. Not that I don't study doctrine, I study doctrine. Actually, for me, every week, uh, I normally devote Mondays to studying doctrine. I will read a theological book every Monday. But at the time he called, I had missed that Monday and I felt so bad. I hadn't studied. Uh, I didn't, I think I had no excuse uh, for that. Daily effort is required. Number two, self-denial is required. Why do you spend so much time on the internet watching things that won't build you up? I always tell Christians at our church that our minds must not be minds for trash. Some of the things on the internet are trash. We were bought at a price. We were redeemed at a price. 
self-denial. Number of us, when we are on our phones, on the internet, we are there. And, you know, we need to deny ourselves certain comforts in order to progress. And then we need focus. Uh, we need focus. Those are some of the things I could say on discipline. Discipline will be required. You need to come up with a timetable or you need a program how you are going to manage your doctrinal studies. Number four, the primary source for building our understanding of Christian doctrine. What sources or resources are we going to use to develop doctrinally? What are the resources available? Primarily, we learn doctrine from the Bible. <laughs> Some of you might have, we are expecting me to say, oh, from books. Yes, I'll come to books later. Primarily, it is from the Bible. The Bible is the primary source of doctrinal building doctrinal development all scripture is god breathed we read in second uh, timothy now that portion that we read there are four things that i want to to, to mention um, as we look at this at the bible as the primary source of uh, doctrinal development. Four things from that portion of scripture that we read. That passage we read, that, uh, let me just turn to it again. That um, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means scripture comes from God. God breathed, the product of God. Scripture did not originate from men. And is profitable. Scripture is profitable for doctrine. We want to learn doctrine, we get it from Scripture. It's profitable for doctrine. The word of God provides a complete guide to doctrine. Primarily, it's the word of God. Do you want to grow in the understanding of doctrine? Do not neglect the study of the scriptures. But it's not only profitable for doctrine, it is also, we are told there, profitable for reproof. What is reproof? Correcting errors. Um, it's not only profitable for teaching the truth. Scripture refutes all falsehoods. That's what it means there. It is profitable to correct errors. I'm coming from a charismatic background where we would speak in tongues, we would fall on the ground, we would do all sorts of things, fast, pray overnight. And as I studied doctrine, the Lord began to show me that some of those things were wrong. Why? Scripture. Um... It refutes all falsehoods. And indeed, 
if someone is in error, we have to correct them. But this conference is about truth and love, isn't it? We correct them in love. But number three, Scripture is profitable for restoring the fallen. And that's what he means by correction. You are corrected so that you start walking in the right path. That's what it means. In the right path. A sinner must be directed to the right or straight path. Perhaps we are going astray. Doctrinally or even in your conduct. We you read the scriptures. They should be able to restore you. But number four. Scripture is profitable in training in all righteousness. Training there means every Christian needs to be disciplined so that we prosper, so that we prosper spiritually, so that we, we our conduct is righteous and scripture is uh, does that work it trains us in righteousness so those four things uh, by we are not teaching on that passage uh, I, I just want to show you that we need scripture to understand doctrine to correct errors to bring us in the right way and also to train us in righteousness. So whenever we are studying the Bible, whenever we are studying the Bible passages, we ought to ask the following questions. <laughs> One time I went to a minister of the word of God in England. I went to his... Um, uh, his office, Dr. Peter Masters, pastor of uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle. And I told him, Pastor, I want a study Bible. Which study Bible would you recommend? He said, I'm not going to recommend a study Bible. I said, what? He said, just get an ordinary Bible. And whenever you read, ask yourself questions. You know, sometimes we can get, you are reading a passage, you have a study Bible instead of meditating on God's word, you are rushing to the notes. He said, okay, they have their own place. Um, but whenever we are reading the Bible, and this is something when I taught some of us who are in scripture, you know, ask yourself certain questions whenever you are reading a Bible passage. Who can tell me one of the questions you should ask when you are reading a Bible passage? Huh? What? Context. Context, yes. What else? What does God have for me? Yes. What did the original audience understand? What is the original audience? All those are important questions. But the first question must be, what doctrine is being taught in this passage? Get it? Very important. What doctrine? <laughs> A friend of mine amazed me. He said, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, Genesis 3, you will find most of the doctrines in those three chapters. I said, wait a minute. He said, yes. You will look at Genesis 1. The power of God, isn't it? That God is all powerful. God is all seeing. The Bible says, and God saw that everything that he had made was including them everywhere. That means God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is omnipresent. We find it in Genesis chapter 1. The Trinity, Genesis chapter 1. The coming of the Savior, Genesis chapter 3. The fall of man, Genesis chapter 3. Sin, Genesis chapter 3. Can you imagine? 
all those doctrines that are packed just in those three chapters. So we must ask ourselves the question, what doctrine is being taught in this passage? Very important. Whenever you are studying the Bible, I'm not going to delve into methods of study. That's another subject. That's one question we should ask. Number two, the other question we should ask is, the other question we should ask is, what errors are refuted in this passage? Now, it may be by implication, if you are studying a passage that teaches on salvation through Christ, by implication it means uh, errors of salvation through works are refuted. So that's what errors are refuted. If the Bible teaches the doctrine of the Trinity, then those who do not believe this, Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, are in error. Number three, the other question you should ask is, what is the right way to walk in? Or is there an example for me to follow here? Is there an example for me to follow here? Is there something I should avoid? That's how we grow in understanding doctrine, in understanding God's truth. The other question is, the, how, can, how does this passage help me to be trained, to be disciplined in righteousness? The word of God is like a mirror. It's like a mirror. You are looking at yourself in the word of God. And, and uh, we must, like James says, not forget what we were. The word of God shows us the errors to avoid. Before we stop our devotions, we must correct those errors. We are family people, we are reading passages. The Bible is talking about gentleness, humility. We must examine ourselves in the light of the word of God. Is there a harsh word I spoke to my wife, to my children? That's how we, 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 we are trained, the word of God. Number five. <laughs> Number five, the relationship between systematic theology and biblical theology. Now, don't worry about those terms. I will simplify them. Um, the relationship between systematic doctrine. For theology, you can just put doctrine. I like theology because if, it, if I was in that other group, these are the terms I would be using. Eh? Systematic doctrine and biblical doctrine. Uh, what's the relationship? And um, I, I want you to, uh, once you get this, it, it will be very helpful. Biblical theology uh, or doctrine is the doctrinal content of the Bible. What we find in Genesis to Revelation, the, doc, the, the theology in those books in the Bible is what we refer to as biblical theology everything we find yeah i know you you get it you know, sometimes you don't be intimidated if someone tells you i'm studying biblical theology i say oh i wonder what this stuff is it's just what you find in genesis to revelation this body of truth is what we refer to as biblical theology but what about systematic theology systematic theology it's also biblical theology. It's just that systematic theology is arranged in blocks. It is, using the word Brother Johnson, I learned from Brother Johnson, is it 35 years ago, systematized. <laughs> you know, Johnson is so fond of those words. Brother Johnson is in the other. It has been systematized for us. There were men who studied the scriptures in depth. Perhaps more than we do. And what they did was, 
out of biblical theology, they arranged these things for us so that we could, uh, it could be a bit easier. You get the point? Yes, it could be a bit easier for us. So that is the relationship. You know, systematic theology or systematic doctrine is actually Bible doctrine. It's just that system systematic, it has been systematized. It's, um, it has been arranged in an orderly way. It is coherent. It holds together. Um, that is the relationship between the two. Um, so, what am I talking about here? In order for you, a young person, to grow, it is better to start with systematic theology. You are also studying biblical theology. It has been systematized for you, arranged for you. And uh, there are various theological books that arrange doctrines. Um, but the common method that you find in many doctrinal books are number one, they will deal with the doctrine concerning the scriptures. Our confession of faith, Baptist confession, begins with the scriptures. Number two, you learn about God and creation. God and creation. In some books, they will split God and then creation. Number three, man in relation to God. We learn about the doctrine of man. We need to learn what scripture says about man. The fall, how sin has affected man, the penalty of sin. We need to learn all that. Number four, the person and work of Christ. You can see the order, isn't it? When you learn about sin, how ugly it is, how terrible it is, then you come to learn about the person and work of Christ, what the Lord has done in dealing with sin. Now, these are blocks. There are several topics under each one of those. You learn some books will include the Holy Spirit after the person and work of Christ. The Holy Spirit... Number six, salvation, the application of the work of redemption. You learn things like regeneration, uh, adoption, faith, conversion, repentance, effectual call. Uh, you learn all those under salvation. Number seven, the doctrine of the church and the means of grace. You can see that it is arranged nice, the doctrine of the church and the means of grace. Number eight, the doctrine of the last things, which we call eschatology. We begin with scripture, with God, and end with, you can see the order. Now, this arrangement is not according to how difficult it is. It's not as if, like the way we learn mathematics, you begin with simpler stuff and then you go to more complicated. That's not how it is. For me personally, I find that when I'm studying uh, God, ah, I sweat. <laughs> These other things are a bit easier. You know, when you are dealing with God, it's, 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 it's quite involving. Yeah. So, so this is, this thing. That, that's how you should study. You must be acquainted with this body of truth quickly some recommended books for systematic theology some recommended books number one a body of divinity by thomas watson he was an anglican man evangelical anglican i love this book this book is in my bedroom i have a study i have taken it from the study I have not prepared to lend it to anyone. <laughs> the body, I don't know how many times I have read it. It gives you the body of truth, scripture, God. And what I love about this book is the applications. For instance, if you are learning about the, if you are learning about the attributes of God, 
it applies uh, what you are learning uh, you it applies uh, there are many places which I could uh, uh, for instance, I, I, I read somewhere when he's talking about the power of God and he applies it. God can scatter all your fears for the future. That's the application. It's not just for the head. Doctrine must be applied. So if you get this book, it's not there. Get it. I got it, uh, I don't know, at LBC some years ago. That's one book. The other one you could, I recommend is, this one is readable. The English is simple. The other one is A Summary of Christian Doctrine, Louis Becker. This is a small book. Now there is a bigger volume by the same writer. The one I told you I finished in two weeks. <laughs> you know, this one is smaller. It is summarized. It is easier. You begin with what is easy you know this one the other one is even the baptist confession of faith let's study our baptist confession of faith number four the manual of theology by j l dag that's another book which i cannot lend dag He's a very rare theologian. You know, one thing about Doug was he was Baptist. He never went to a theological school. He studied theology on his own. And this book is being used in seminaries, Baptist seminaries. Uh, J.L. Doug, The Manual of Theology. Brief, concise, powerful. There is the superb work uh, in recent works by Robert Raymond. It's going to be with the Lord. Uh, a New Systematic Theology was a Presbyterian. I have never gotten hold of this book. I'm told it's a, it's a good book. Pastor Garifungwa recommends it and others. Uh, please let me know if you find this book elsewhere. <laughs> a New Systematic Theology by Robert Raymond. That's five. Number six, Foundations of Christian Doctrine. Boyce Montgomery. It's going to be with the Lord. Number seven, foundations for the flock. Kawata Baptist. Your pastor wrote a book. Yeah, I almost said, it. those of you from Kawata, raise your hands if you have read it. I don't want to embarrass you. But if he's your pastor, please study his books. When he was writing that book, he had you in mind. He has recently written another book on the Holy Spirit. One thing about Pastor Mbewe's writings is that they are easy. The English is not complicated. You know, you will read everything. Uh, so you read those. Uh, the other one, if you have graduated from this go to dublin ah dublin is is a heavyweight <laughs> i'm still battling with dublin it's a heavyweight it's heavy i bought the dublin and attempted to read it i felt and so i started pangono pangono eh? started with the smaller works uh start with simpler theological books but there are other number six, other ways of learning theology, other ways of learning theology. Electronic means. In the late 80s, a friend of mine is in the UK, Kunda Kalifungwa, would lend me some tips um, by a preacher from the USA, Pero Grisot. He would deal with doctrinal matters, creation, providence, the Trinity, a powerful preacher. And he helped me appreciate one of the points of Calvinism. 
particular redemption, I had struggled with particular redemption. But when I listened to Pharaoh Grissold, my doubts were cleared. And now, those steps are now obsolete, isn't it? You just go to YouTube and click Pharaoh Grissold, the decrees of God, and you start listening. You are traveling from Lusaka to Kitwe. Share briefly the gospel with the person seated next to you, lovingly, friendly, or give them a tract. I'm a Christian. Maybe you can just find time to read this and put your earphones, bundles now. You have bundles and you'll be listening to some of these things. As you travel, by the time you reach Kitwe, you will have learned something about the decrease of God. Don't waste time on trash. There's a lot of trash on the internet. A lot of it. But we have to choose, and there are a lot of wonderful things we can learn from the internet. We can, we can electronic means, uh, conferences such as this one, planning for it each year, attendance upon the preaching of God's word, pastors expound, Doctrine. We teach doctrines from our pulpits. Certain magazines, magazines, Reformation Zambia. Pastors will normally take up a doctrinal issue. And uh, all those are other ways in which we can learn doctrine. Lastly, um, some guidelines uh, this is number seven. Some guidelines on reading doctrinal books. What are some of the guidelines as you read doctrinal books? Number one, read and meditate. Reading is not a substitute for prayerful meditation. If you are reading this book, you know, Thomas Watson, you read two or three paragraphs, you begin to pray. I love those books that send me to prayer. Read and meditate. It's not just about reading, cramming your head with information. Think upon these glorious truths. Let them melt your heart. Number two, time is short. Select with care the books which you read. There are many theological books. It's looking at my shelf today. <laughs> One shelf is just full of theology. And, you know. Uh, but select with care. Read the best books. There are many. Read them. How do I know the best books? How do I know the best books? Anyone? Can I tell you? Go to your pastor. <laughs> he will tell you. Pastor, recommend the book which is I can start with. He will be very happy. Go to your pastor. Uh, he will guide you. Uh, some of these are very good books. The Body of Divinity. Um, Summary of Christian Doctrine but read the best books. Know your books. Mark them. Number three, start with simpler theological books. Number four, there are certain books that you have to read over and over. They become part of you. For me, I've chosen Doug, the Manual of Theology, and this one. This one is marked and marked and marked I don't know how many times I've read through this book. So there are certain books that you will read over again and again. Mark them. Make some notes. Write some statements you wish to remember as you read. Invest in a good book like this one where you are writing your thoughts, what God is teaching you on a passage. Number five, do not read too much. 
<laughs> uh, you wear yourself. Um, I don't know why I was reading too much. I think the Lord was preparing me for ministry. <laughs> we have to do other things. Uh, uh, even 30 minutes every day will translate into considerable reading by the end of the year. Can you imagine if you just spent 30 minutes, we spent hours and hours on the internet. Just 30 minutes. Of course, that is the barest minimum. We could do better than that. Just 30 minutes. You could read a number of books by the end of the year. Don't read too much. Number six. Read ancient and modern theological books. Um, I used to think that the Puritans were the only ones who were deep. But there are modern writers we can, we can tend to. Uh, so read both. Number seven, read the scriptures. The reading of the theological books must not replace the reading of the scriptures. We read these books to shed more light on what the Bible says. Number eight, converse together on the subjects you are reading. What? Talk. Find a friend you can share with. For me, you know who I share with? Theological issues or doctrinal issues? Who can guess? My wife. I'll read a powerful book. I say, honey, who is this man of sin the Bible? This is what William Hendrickson says. This is what this person says. And it doesn't have to be a very long discussion. I would do that very in the morning. She's dressing up to go for work. I said, I've just been reading this. Look, look, it, it's so natural. And she will read also and we, we will talk, you know, share. But if it is something very heavy, I have a friend of mine in the UK will be coming uh, next month to visit us. We will talk. Recently we are talking about the Lord's table. The Lord's Supper. Find someone. Those of you who are in relationships, discuss doctrine. Don't just look into each other's eyes. It's beautiful to do that. But also get deep in doctrine. This is what to stabilize your life. Talk about these things. Find someone you can, you know, you can share these things with. Number nine, knowledge comes from the Lord. It's the Lord who teaches us. Studies must be done in a prayerful attitude. You should be able to say, the Lord has taught me. With all humility, let the Lord teach you his holy truth. Therefore, pray that you will be obedient what he says. The psalmist says, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things in your law. Conclusion. Sorry. Conclusion. Theology is a lifelong study. It's a lifelong study. You might think I know a lot. The more I know, the more I realize there is much more to be known. This queen of sciences, there is much, much more. It will occupy, if you are to live 1,000 years, I don't think you could come to a point where you say, now I understand all theology. That's what I find. It's a lifelong study. Start today. Start today. If you haven't started, God's truth is extensive and deep. Studying doctrine must be regarded as a priority and as a necessity. May the Lord raise a generation of young people 
who are mighty in the scriptures to his glory. When we meet again next year, shall our testimony be, I have grown theologically. I have made some progress theologically. Um, it's a wonderful experience to study God's truth and uh, it, you are just constantly amazed. You may have come across certain believers who are like constantly fresh, constantly fresh. You meet them, you are just with them for a short while, you are lifted, your burdens, <laughs> it's like your burdens just roll away. Uh, it is men who are in the world. May the Lord help us to delve in the depth of his truth. Amen. Sorry. Ah, 